Do stem cells treat multiple sclerosis? Well, I previously spoke about hematopoietic stem cell transplant and the treatment of MS, but this is fundamentally an immunosuppressive treatment. What about using mesenchymal stem cells to regrow nerve tissue? Well, at the legendary Tisch MS Research Center in New York, doctors gave 20 people with progressive multiple sclerosis, many with advanced disability, intrathecal mesenchymal stem cells and followed them for years, and some of them seem to benefit. We'll take a close look at their latest publication publication and you can read for yourself in the link below. Let's have some fun. So this study was done at the world famous Tisch MS Research Center of New York and you can see Dr. Sadiq pictured to the right and they used autologous bone marrow derived cells in other words cells harvested from the patient's own bone marrow harvested by a biopsy and they used complicated and to some extent proprietary techniques to convert these cells into neuroprogenitive cells and the theory is that these cells could then grow new nerve tissue or myelin or possibly have other effects such as as regulating local inflammation or nerve growth and hopefully promoting nerve repair. And they injected these cells directly into the cerebrospinal fluid doing three intrathecal injections. And this procedure is similar to a spinal tap. Instead of drawing out fluid for diagnostic purposes, they're injecting the cells in and their target dose was approximately 10 million cells, which they achieved. And so they did three injections three months apart. Now, to get into the trial, you had to have progressive MS, either primary or secondary progressive MS, and the expanded disability status score, which is a measure of disability in MS, had to be greater than equal to three. In other words, you had to have moderate disability or greater, and if you want to learn more about EDSS, I have a separate video on this topic. They also wanted to look at people who didn't have recent active inflammation, and so they excluded people who had new or gadolinium enhancing lesions on the MRI within the last year and the reason for this is because people with recent flares or recent new lesions could spontaneously recover and that would confound the results. Now people who were on disease modifying therapies continued their drugs so there were no changes there. The exception is one subject, subject number nine, who started the drug rituximab after the third intrathecal injection and rituximab is a B-cell depleting agent similar to Ocrevus and Kisimta. And this slide shows the timeline of the study. So they screened everyone three months before and they gave the stem cells at zero, three, and six months. And they also looked at biomarkers in the cerebral spinal fluid and we'll look at those results later. And so they looked at the cerebral spinal fluid prior to the first dose and then three months after the last dose and they followed everyone for a total of 30 months to look at their clinical and MRI outcomes along with biomarkers. And just to give you a sense of who was in the study, there were 20 subjects total. 16 had secondary progressive MS, 4 had primary progressive MS, and most, 70%, were female, reflecting the overall sex distribution of multiple sclerosis. The average age was 49, ranging from 27 to 65, and the average dur disease duration of MS was 19 years, ranging from 10 to 32 years. And most importantly, the average baseline EDSS, again the level of disability, was 6.8. Now that's quite high in a multiple sclerosis study as many studies exclude people with an EDSS of six or higher. So at EDSS six, a cane is required to walk 100 meters and at 6.5, a, a walker or bilateral support is required and at seven, walking is very limited. And you can see the range is from 3.5 to 8.5. And so you have to give Dr. Sadiq and his team credit in trying to find a treatment for people with already established significant disability. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber and I make videos about MS every Wednesday so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications and if you appreciate this video please click like. Now I'm going to show you the results and you'll see that some people seem to benefit from the treatment while others did not and the easiest way to show you is to show you exactly what happened in graphical form based on changes in their EDSS based on their response or non-response to the treatment exactly how it's shown in the article. So two people in the study had a significant improvement. One person had an EDSS of 5 5.5 and went all the way down to 2. Now this is very unusual in progressive MS. At EDSS 5.5 that means someone was walking unassisted but could walk less than 200 meters and went all the way down to mild disability. And another person went from an EDSS of 3.5 moderate disability all the way to 1.5. Again, 
atypical of progressive MS. There were five people who had a modest improvement. One went from an EDSS of 7 to 6.5. Now that may seem like a small change, but at EDSS 7, walking is very limited compared to 6.5 where someone could walk with a walker. So this could be life-changing. And several, four people to be exact, went from an EDSS of 6 to 5.5, meaning they no longer needed a cane to walk, but they still had difficulty walking long distances and couldn't walk more than 200 meters without assistance. There were six people who were stable, and you can't see every person since the lines overlap. One of them, the most disabled person in the study, started with an EDSS of 8.5 and seemed to improve temporarily but went back to their baseline. However, these six people did not worsen despite progressive multiple sclerosis. And there were five people who were worse. Four of them started with an EDSS of 7.5, and they fluctuated a little bit but ended up with an EDSS of 8. And even though, again, this is a small change on the EDSS scale, it could be a clinically significant change. And one person went from an EDSS of 6.5, walking with a walker, all the way to EDSS 8, which is a very significant decline. Although only one person worsened on the EDSS scale by more than 0.5 over 20 people, which I think is pretty good for progressive multiple sclerosis. Now in the study, 10 out of the 20 participants were able to walk at baseline. So in those individuals, they did another test called the time 25 foot walk, which is simply how long it takes you to walk 25 feet. And in a young, healthy person, the time 25 foot walk may be about four seconds. And you can see their time is ranged from six seconds, which is just a little bit of gait impairment up to 97 seconds, which is of course very slow. And then they checked it again three months after treatment and then two years after treatment. And you can see in the column to the right, they looked at the percentage change after two years relative to baseline. Now, there's a little bit of day-to-day -day fluctuation, but a change of more than 20% is considered significant. And three people improved relative to baseline by more than 20%. And again, this is in progressive MS that often gets worse versus only one person who worsened by more than 20%, and it was by 21%, and the rest were approximately the same. As I mentioned earlier, they also looked at biomarkers in the cerebral spinal fluid, and I'm not going to go through all these charts, but to summarize it, on average, there was a decrease after the treatment in the inflammatory marker CCL2, and an increase in interleukin-8, another inflammatory meteor, and CXCL12, along with hepatocyte growth factor, and interestingly, the increase in these factors was associated with a lower probability of getting better after the treatment. And just to cover a few other things from the trial, people were concerned about a potential risk of infection, meningitis, or cancer, but there were really no serious side effects in the study. There were some reports of headaches, musculoskeletal pain, and some skin issues, but many of these may have been unrelated to the treatment. They did MRI scans, which were stable in all 20 subjects, so no new or active lesions. They also did tests on hand function, the nine-hole peg test, which is a measure of hand-eye coordination as depicted here, but there were no differences, so no benefits in terms of upper extremity function that could be discovered in the trial. And as I mentioned, the non-responders did have a little bit of a difference of a cerebrospinal fluid profile, which could be useful in future studies. Now, it's hard to draw firm conclusions from this study because it was a small and unrandomized study. There could be some placebo effect here. However, a larger randomized phase Phase two trial is underway, and in fact, it's fully recruited and ongoing, but there are no interim results yet. I'll certainly let you know. And they're actually going to do six intrathecal injections every two months versus placebo. Now, in the pilot study with 20 patients, of course, you saw that people who were a little bit less disabled tended to do better, and so they are going to require that the EDSS be equal or less than 6.5. So in other words, you have to be able to walk with a walker, and that is unfortunate in my opinion, but apparently it was required by the FDA. Also, the age of the participants had to be less than or equal to 65. However, it is a randomized double-blind study, and there are going to be 50 people, 40 with secondary progressive MS, and 10 with primary progressive MS, and of course, we look forward to the results.